the importance of what they said about not abstracting, not just theorizing, but personalizing these important stories that we are going to tell today. In my day-to-day -day life, I'm a culture editor at a site called New Frame, a social justice news site. And in my day-to-day -day work, I witness the power of storytelling all the time. The power of stories not only just to be told, but to complicate the narrative, to encode the narrative, to change the narrative, to revisit and to redo. And I think that that's the spirit of today, as we learn, unlearn, relearn. And I love that formulation because I think the relearning is critical. And we are part of that change that is driving forward what new stories are going to look like. And as a culture editor, it's also such an honor to witness the power of culture to do that work. And as part of today's proceedings, Dagano has commissioned a series of short films that really look at Mamwini's legacy, at the legacy of a new kind of health equity. And we're just about to see the first one of these that is called Loretta and They Did Not Die, directed by Zeketiwe Ngobo of Fusebox. This will be followed by our first panel, which is titled Black Women, Erasure, Resistance and Persistence, moderated by Degano Lifelong Fellow, Hasina Majid, and featuring two brilliant and critical feminist historians who are part of a new generation of scholars, Dr. Atambile Masola, Masola and Zikona Valela. Thank you very much. Loretta Ngobo is a writer, a feminist, an author, a politician, but most of all, she's been the most amazing mother to me. I think Sister Loretta is my hero because she did things her way. Whatever she wanted, whether it was going to Fort Hare, when no one in her district had ever been to university. She was always seeking to bring others along on this journey of hers, of finding her voice and making that voice count. She went on to teach in the University of London. She took up women's issues. She did writing. She would have been sad if um, people shied away from having their voices heard. Because everybody has got a story to tell. In Zulu, when we want to authenticate your origin, we ask a question, where is your navel? My navel is just down there. What I write about are things that have happened, that I'm aware have happened. In recording my own reactions to them, I am also recording history. Although my grand, great-grandmother was a poet, None of my family are poets. The only one who is poetic in her approach, I know she took it from my great-grandmother, is my sister. It's pure skanagazabandu, so so ba poetic, no ba good in writing. Sasuka emman, kanti ufuza, ufuza ukoko wedu, gishomnu koko wam umamgila. We go into story to be changed by it. We go into story to be healed by it. We go into story to shift our thinking, our perspective of who we are.
we never come out of story the same way. My literary background, if I was to speak widely, was from the traditional stories that our parents taught us. As I later learned, the children I was teaching, if a child wasn't making much move in writing or things like that, I concentrated on the story side of things and found that they soon sharpened. Our minds are related to storytelling. you know, those were used to educate children. It, it stories were not just being told because you just want to tell a story. There was always a lesson embedded in there. It teaches you, yes, about your sense of identity, it teaches you about um, your sense of belonging, and, and also the, 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 the fact that you matter. My parents, we were in the rural areas, they didn't have a big cupboard of books, but they had boxes of books. My sister and I, we realized that whenever our parents were talking and they didn't want us to hear what they were saying, they would speak in English. So we began to see the connection between the box and the language they were using in the house. And uh, we got interested ourselves. We began to read. We began to take a lot of interest in what was the written word and what secrets it could hold. Ngoba ukoko witu wafunda e inanda seminari. Kuse umesis Edwards, umdo kalo akala i inanda seminari. Ukoko wafunde was wafika ku standard two. Kao uti she would talk a lot of English, trying to jump over my head. Beautiful adjective of a quality thing. Education was fundamental in my grandfather's family, and it became fundamental in my own family. When my mother met another teacher, she was already a teacher herself. What mau tatu yetu pasu sean seven wam tata wam aplaela e inanda seminari. What is a senanda? Wasuga umis plan sam e missionary lady e a senanda. Wapalela uma watingi elugum fundi sa minange mali yam minangzo tengzo padala yonge imali yes call. She was head prefect of the whole seminary. She was the head of the debate. We knew that Inanda was going to be number one because of Loretta. English was her mother tongue. <laughs> and when I got to Fort Hare, I was so excited by the thinking at the time, Fort Hare was really powerful. It, it got us all to open our eyes as to what we were doing and what was happening to us, what was happening to the country, what power we had to change things. Almost every night there was some association meeting. And I went and listened and, and just drank all this knowledge and this wisdom, this new sight, insight. Mm -hmm. I got my political education mm -hmm. at Fort Hare. Unfortunately, as a, as a young student at, at Fort Hare, I was almost discouraged, you know, in the art of writing because at the time when I went to Fort Hare, there were only 38 girls at Fort Hare. And when I say 38, I mean from the whole country and all the African states. You know, no matter how much effort you put in into what you thought was right, the professors seemed a lot more interested in male students. This prepared me for a situation where I was discouraged from writing. I didn't think anybody really would be interested in hearing what I had to say. When my mother left Fort Hare in 1953 and went on to do a diploma, she became more involved in the resistance of the apartheid regime. In 1956, she was one of the many women who marched to the union buildings. Our politics have always undermined women who were really onlookers and the, the cheering party. It was not until about the mid-50s that uh, women were, I will call it, assaulted by the government. 
they began to rethink the position of uh, not giving women the passes. That's when women now began to meet. Although, you know, I have uh, written about the rural women who still surprise me to this day, how more or less on their own fought so hard uh, against the passes in the rural areas throughout the late 50s. Mum was raided when I was an infant by the police. I don't think they were even that clear about what specifically they were looking for, but I think Mum knew and I think it was within hand. So she picked me up, took that document, shoved it into my nappy, hoping that I wouldn't do anything untoward. <laughs> and then she pinched me. I began to cry. And then she was rocking me as they're looking all over for this information. But it was already sort of in safekeeping on my bottom. <laughs> the security forces came and were ready to arrest her. So she left South Africa in 1963 on the 22nd of May. She went into exile. The reason why I came into exile was because I didn't want to leave my children and go to prison like my husband. The English climate provided me with the space to write. I had lived through South Africa through so much fear England is just the right place for me. They leave me alone. When it's dark, I close the door and there's peace outside. It's quiet and my children grow up inside. Man to tell you, saying, Balega Mapunu, Gap Ribogu, Yogu political, Gap Tribanga, Tuba Panskom, Tinga Pumanga Ham, O Winning Angushisa, Nasa Swazim, O Winning Angushisa, Nasa Zambia, O Winning Angushisa. Next time, So my first book, Cross of Gold, is a combination of a lot of writings that I, I did uh, at a time when I, I, I couldn't accept that I could write a book. I was a publisher, and she was the only person that I talked about my book, about my writing. And then she says to me one day, Loretta, I would like to see what you've written. I said, no, I can't give you what I've written because it doesn't make sense to anybody else, and so on and so forth and so forth. I give it to her. After about two to three weeks, I get a letter from Longman. We have received your, your manuscript from Margaret Leacham. And to my shock, I phone her, what have you gone and done? She laughs and she says, yes, I thought it was worth something, a, a good editor could put it together. So we started working on it. Feminism is what I found in England. At first, it kind of jolted me. I was being attacked by feminists. Right through this book, women are not free. Feminists were not happy. The psych in me told me that women could not go far. I, I've had a struggle, which fortunately, the feminist experience in England helped me overcome. So she was really, I think, acutely aware through her own experience of how black women are made invisible as producers of knowledge. So she provides this platform with Let It Be Told, and that is what is so incredible about her, that she was a writer for other writers. So I think that's something that a lot of the newer writers take for granted. They don't know the struggles that your mother had to go through. I was really very um, engaged by the fact that she had that anthology, Let It Be Told. That was showcasing black British women writers in essays. So that was an important landmark to me. And the fact that your mother did that was an important indication of how she 
saw the importance of getting black women's voices out there. But there was a book that I'd always known mm -hmm. I would write, mm -hmm. a story of women mm -hmm. who had brought me up. <laughs> the, the story of my life, my, my childhood, of the life of uh, migration, people leaving the, 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 the rural areas to go and work in the cities. What life meant to me as a child in, in that rural part of South Africa. And that's why there's a lot of that in And They Didn't Die. When we see, for example, a writer like Alan Payton, who writes about the same community, um, in Cry the Beloved Country. He has one African woman, Marku Malo, and the only line he writes about her is she stood at the window with bovine eyes, mute with the suffering of oxen. That is African women in the imagination of a white liberal. That is the tradition that she enters into, Mrs. Noble, and writes these rich, fully agentic lives for these women. They are mothers, they are wives, they are sexual. In short, what she does is she confers full humanity and dignity to women who have been looked at as objects. But I was not free myself at the time. Even while I wanted to write this book, even while I started to write this book, I think my own liberation came through this book. Take, I just wanted to take a moment to just say, Ketiwe, please stand so that we can just salute you and honor you for that film. And Balesa, please. I don't know how much more excited I can get about today. <laughs> As it goes on and on, I just get more and more excited about what we're doing, what we're making, what we're building in this space. Um, I'd like to invite the speakers to the stage and just to note that they will be joined by Sipom Tati, who will be joining us via video link. Where is your navel? And watching this brings a power inside of you that makes you shake. Not a nervous shake, but a shake of pride and a shake that can invoke so much of emotion that you'd want to just sob. And when we speak about the navel, it's the source of life. It's where your umbilical cord connects. And there's cultural talks around the importance of the navel and the importance of the umbilical cord, and how even though the physical one may deteriorate in time, the invisible one is what drags us through life. And what our mothers pass through us, besides the actual nourishment from food, is the power of their thought, and the power of their spirit, and the, the strength imprinted in their DNA that shapes us. And every one of us has been born of that mother. And that navel is what holds us where we are and where we wish to be. 
No matter how far that cord may stretch, it always came from one source, the source of a woman. And welcome to our panelists. And I'm so glad that you're here. And Sipo online, how are you? Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I don't ever like to introduce people because I always believe we all have our way of identifying with ourselves. So I'll give you a brief second to introduce yourself, your name and what you stand for, and then we can take the discussion further. We'll start with Sipo online. Hi, can you hear me? Yay. So, um, I'm, I'm Sipo Mtati. Um, my relationship with Takato is that um, I'm the chair of the board program committee. But as a human being, I'm a feminist um, who is um, moving around for many years. Um, in the social justice space um, with many of you in the room. Um, and um, I do not like that. So that's really who I am. I'm a feminist who um, is so excited right now. <laughs> with you all, even virtually. Thank you, Sibo. Please take the floor. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Zikona Valela. I'm from a little town called Onne, which was before then called King William's Town, and before then Onne. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am I'm a historian, and um, yeah, I think I'll just leave it there. I don't like to talk too much about myself. So Africa needs to always say her story, otherwise she will always be spoken for. And in Loretta's okay. story, Thanks. it becomes very important that we start to identify the fundamental importance about how we document our stories and document it in such a way that nobody can take that away from us through narratives imposed upon us. And that's the challenge we face even in research when we try to bring solutions to Africa, but we have to quote European interventions. And we start to diminish our own value and our own capacity um, and our own ability to solve our own problems. And then you look at the people like Mam Loretta, who in her own way and in a giant way, found a way to solve problems her own way. And she used the resources of people strategically placed to oppress her um, to find that liberation to write. And I want to bring it to the panelists. Um, what did the story invoke for you in terms of the themes that came out from it, what it meant then, and what it means today in 2021? So we have a time limit of five minutes um, per speaker, but if you can bring forward what it, stood, what, what it meant for you, the feelings that it invoked and the themes that came out, what was it then and what is it now? Um, shall we start with you? Thanks. Um, so it was so moving for me to see that because the last time I spoke to Ketiwe, um, it was, she was so generous because we were chatting about her mom's legacy and we were talking about how we were going to write it for a children's book. So to see that 
um, story and to hear Mama's voice because I've never actually heard her voice. I've, and it's one thing to read and they didn't die and it's one thing to read Cross of Gold and then to write about it because that's you know an intellectual project that we have to do. But it's one thing to hear her voice and to hear her tell her own story. And I think for me, Mam Loretta is one of those people who was so clear. I think Barbara mentioned it as well in the, in the clip. She knew that if she didn't do it, no one would do it. So, and I think she's the example of many other black women who have done the exact same thing as far back as the 1800s, who knew that if they didn't tell their story, if they didn't write, no one else would do it for them. And uh, another wonderful example is someone like Mam Ellen Kuzwayo, who's also aware that if I don't tell other women's stories, no one is going to do it. So when you look at Call Me Woman, she includes the names of other black women. So for me to know about Ellen Pumlangozwana, it is through Mam Ellen Kuzwayo because it was her teacher and she felt the need to write about her teachers. In order for me to know about Mam Frida Matthews, it is through Mam Ellen Kuzwayo's writing about writing um, about what uh, Mam Frida Matthews meant to her as her teacher. So that's the powerful thing is that when black women write, they liberate everyone. It's not an individualistic sort of navel gazing project, but it's very much uh, a healing project, I think. And it's about calling other women's names and it's about um, placing themselves within a lineage and placing themselves within a community. And it, it, it's, it's that matrilineal work where, um, you know, from the Eastern Cape, Kutamas is Tote. And often, Kwa'u's Tote, which is to, um, to fetch yourself. You don't know who's Tote. I, I didn't, to fetch yourself, okay. I'll go with that one. We often, you start with your father's surname. So when I introduce myself, I'll say, and maybe, now I've started saying, and I think that's the tension with when women write is that it's constantly bringing in that matrilineal line because we know it has, it's always precarious and it's always in, in a position of disappearing because it's not important. Um, I mean, I think in addition, I think watching that video confirmed a couple of things for me. Um, that sometimes erasure is not necessarily a plot and that it is um, sometimes an act of survival. So the, the, the moments where she talks about burning her own writing um, those are moments, I mean, thinking of the context, those are moments of survival. I mean, I think um, uh, Nomboni Sokasa writes about it also in, in, um, in an article, Remembering Chrisani. And um, she talks about how letters from Chris to, you know, Utabawo or, the, or, or, or his mom, you know, would have to be destroyed because that would be evidence that would be used, you know, to, to kind of um, dismantle the struggle. So it's not always this, we are gonna get rid of the women type of thing, but it's also, and I think we need to kind of hold space for what that kind of thing means. Also, I am interested as well in bringing into the conversation, I think even in the work that I do, of the women who were not women of letters. Yeah. Um, because I do think that in, 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 um, in, in, in this moment, um, in our time, there is the, you know, the commemorations that are coming up that are kind of unearthing the stories and the narratives of, of your matrekes and, and of the nobos. But what about, what of? The, the, the contemporaries that did not write. Yes. And this is why I am interested in Winnie Mandela because she does not write, yes. but she uses a different kind of vocabulary captured through her aesthetic. So that's why, and, and that's why, for example, when I think of Matleke, who existed between, you know, existed even in the early 20th century, why do we not talk about Nondeta Bungu? 
who started the first, you know, black woman prophetess who started a church that still exists to this day. Um, and also, you know, the fact that she was, when she was incarcerated, she's incarcerated around the time of the Bullhook Massacre. So we know of all Enoch Mkichima who were sent to the mines to do hard labor. But there's this woman who's then committed to a mental asylum. So I'm interested then in the ways in which these women that subvert in the ways that people like Nondetta and Winnie did are rendered unstable. Because you, don't, you did not put her in the, you didn't throw her in jail. Right? And in, and in Winnie's case, you threw her in jail, you put her in solitary confinement, you banned her, you banished her, you put her under house arrest, and many other things that a lot of people didn't go through, but you also had to do the act of rendering this person unstable. Yeah. Through your propagandists like your Chris Saunders and what, because also we need to think about in, in remembering someone like Winnie, in remembering someone like Umamu Nobo, we also have to remember the machinery yeah. that produced them. And we don't side, we don't say against, against these women who responded to the machinery, we never say, remember, there was a Chris Saunders. In order for there to be a Winnie, there had to be a major Swanepoel, right? So that we are able to understand the very, so that we are true to the context when we talk about her when we talk about the violence, when we talk about the writing and what it's writing against, we need to, we need to know and unravel the against. Yeah, so those are the things that I'm kind of thinking through. Thank you. Sipo, can you hear us? Is Sipo Kazi online? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hello? You can hear me? Okay, yes. great. All right, great. Thanks. So, I mean, um, um, thank you again, you know, Tekano, for curating this uh, amazing event. And um, so sorry I could not be there. So, maybe just to kind of uh, build on some of the threads um, and to kind of build it, you know, bring it home for, for Tekano. Um, you know, because, um, you know, this, the talk of erase, erase has become a buzzword, right, by everybody. Everybody's like, you know, we must fight erasure. Um, and often, you know, um, the danger is it gets, um, you know, reduced um, to kind of, um, you know, an empty, depoliticized, meaningless concept. Um, and so what really kind of triggered me about, um, you know, not you know, about um, the, the movie, um, but also the conversation, um, you know, by my co um, colleagues before me, is just how deep um, and, you know, damaging, um, you know, this um, process of erasure is and how systemic, um, and I, I would uh, argue deliberate, right, and, and how important um, because we are Tecano and, you know, um, we have to kind of make this relevant to us, how important it is that we make the link between you know, erasure, its effects, um, and, um, you know, the kind of outcomes, um, including inequity. Um, because, of course, you know, erasure is about um, you know patriarchy and what it needs um, in order to reproduce itself as a system of domination. It is about racial capitalism um, and what it needs um, to reproduce itself, um, and how necessary erasure was um, not just to kind of the white machinery of apartheid. But also, you know, to the black nationalist, um, you know, patriarchs who needed black women for the labor that they can, you know, the social reproductive labor that they can, um, you know, offer, um, but needed to then kind of, um, you know, write them out of the script when the story of liberation is being told. Um, and importantly for me, um, you know, how this pattern has continued um, and, and the insidious ways in which 
the kind of um, you know um, development path we took um, you know um, post apartheid or into the kind of democratic era was you know a continuation um, you know of the strategy where black women in particular um, you know whether it's Winnie Mandela who will valorize when it suits us and then will rubbish you know when when it suits patriarchy's interests you know, or the ordinary women, um, you know, who were the soldiers um, really that kept society going. Um, and then when we had the power, you know, um, when, when, when liberation was won, um, you know, um, we just continued, you know, the, the kind of um, writing out of the script, adopting policies that made it um, you know, that the, the interests, um, you know, of these, um, you know, black women bodies um, would not really feature in the ways that it needed to feature in terms of how we reimagined the post-apartheid society. And that today we are still fighting these struggles, um, you know, that Mam Loretta um, and, you know, the women, other women who wrote, but also you know, the women who were the kind of, um, you know, beacons of resistance from, you know, the big ones and the big names, the winnies, um, you know, to ordinary women, um, you know, who, um, you know, kept the resistance going. And so for me, you know, this, um, I think um, Mam Loretta's words are really triggering about, you know, um, the condition we are in and how it really isn't a, a, like an accident of history um, and how important for, a, you know, because this is, you know, I'm a, <laughs> a Takado person, how important this conversation we're having is to what it is that Takano is about. I mean, equity, um, you know, is not an unfortunate byproduct of, you know, history. It is about systemic decisions that are made about who belongs where, who is going to be located where in the queue of production um, and, you know, and, and who's going to be designated what roles and who's going to be designated what power. And so, you know, it's a, for me, it's a really deep kind of and triggering, um, you know, and I think invitation to to why it is that we have to really kind of get a handle um, on this concept of erasure and not allow it to be depoliticized in some of the ways that it is. Um, and to also kind of, um, you know, prevent it from being kind of seen as being about reclaiming history, because as we know, it is in the moment. I mean, we are seeing erasure on steroids, right, under these pandemic conditions where, you know, who gets to speak um, and whose story gets to be told by who, um, you know, and who gets to be able to squeeze into this little technological screen, you know, that we are now jostling to fit into because, you know, we are living in a virtual world. Um, and, 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 and how dangerous, um, you know, this moment is for the perpetuation of, of this kind of um, violence of erasure and how critical it is. That... Sorry, sorry to cut you. We're running out of time. But thank you so much sure. for, your, for your contribution um, in the space. Um, I quickly want to round it up and bring it back to uh, context matters. And when we speak about context that matters, People are political, every person is political, and the politics of the situations that we find ourselves in pushes us um, to put forward the messages that, that embolden us and the messages that put us out there to start speaking our stories and bringing in the stories of other people as we say it. But in the same space, the politics of spaces um, can also drive us to a point where our resistance and our persistence can burn us out. And Erasure can have many faces, and one of the faces is the, the face of erasure when we ourselves reach a point in that drive to resist and that persistence and ongoing fire within us to, to say these stories and fight these battles where we set ourselves on fire. And one of the stories in Mam Loretta's story is when she said, 
I went to England and I could close my door and there was peace outside. And I think that if we just bring back to the context of where we are, all our stories are important and we should be writing them and speaking them and screaming them and singing them in whichever way we would pass those stories on. But we need to do it from a place of self-acceptance, but self-care and self-love where we don't burn ourselves in the process of trying to say the story because that's when our narratives can become hijacked and it's easily portrayed as she was a loose cannon and she was trying to set fire to something that really wasn't there and in the process she burned herself. And so I would like to thank Mam Loretta, her family, the people that put this together and our experts on our panel. Thank you so much for your input and your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you.